Welcome, welcome to the Rick Helps Real Estate Show, where we look at the Arizona real estate numbers and try to figure out what's going on. It's getting harder every day. I already have a comment here from Smack Smack saying, Rick, please tell me inventory's up. The answer to that is yes and no. Today we have 5,094 listings on the market. The encouraging thing is, and this is a changer, game changer here. In the past seven days, we had 4,179 homes come on the market. That's considerably higher than what we've been seeing. We've been seeing about 3,600 homes come on the market and 3,967 went under contract. So if you look here on the uh, seven day moving average, kind of hard to tell, but the blue line, which is listings coming on is slightly higher by about 200 homes than the, uh, than the red line homes coming under contract. So it's uh, a little encouraging there in that, um, listings finally are higher than last year by a smidge. So we're going to have to watch it like we do every day here and uh, see just how much of a trend that is. But that is encouraging. I've got some other numbers to share here as well. I think uh, one of the things that uh, we're going to talk about today is what the heck is Zillow doing? And why did I start with that? So here's what's going on with Zillow. Zillow filed this thing known as a b7 exemption now it's kind of complicated so let me run it through as simple as i can basically an exemption is an exemption to keep from filing how much you sold the home for on county records and the affidavits and uh so to be exempt um, a transfer between related legal entities for no consideration or nominal consideration in other words they give away the house Allowable relationships are, and they run through a bunch of these, but the kicker is um, Zillow's selling a lot of these homes to a place, to an outfit called, uh, let's see, who's, who is it here? Um, Progress Residential, and they're not recording the price. And uh, why is that a big deal? Do we care? And uh, the answer, short answer is yes, we care, because the funny thing is when uh, you file an exemption, um, the title company has no obligation to see if you qualify for that exemption. So they see the exemptions filed. Okay, we won't, we won't put the price in. So there's this transfer of real estate and there's, there's no price listed. And so they're not obligated to see if that exemption is valid. So the only person that can change that and say, no, Zillow, you can't do that is the state of Arizona. Are they going to get involved here? Well, we don't know. And uh, it says here, it could get worse since if Zillow is seen to get away with this action, it may encourage more people to claim this exemption from filing affidavits of value in the system that we rely on for keeping track of prices. In Arizona, it could start to get very shaky. So another negative effect is that the comps in the affected subdivision are going to be based on the inflated prices paid by Zillow and not the no lower ones paid by Progress. What I think is going on, and Michael Orr thinks, I just agree with Mike, and they don't want, want anybody to know how much of a loss they're taking on these houses. They grossly overpaid for these homes. And they just, I don't know if they're trying to hide it from the stockholders or your neighbors. They just don't want anybody to know that they're having a good old-fashioned fire sale and selling these things to investors. And uh, why aren't they selling them to you and me? So they're just dumping them in the market and they must be dumping them at a very low price. Now, caution here, they're not dumping them because they think real estate values are going to go down. If they were just to hang on to them for three months, they'll make up that money that they're losing today, but they don't want them on their books. We're still going up at two and a half percent a month. So it doesn't take a uh, mathematician or a Harvard scholar to know that if you just hang on to it for a couple more months, you're going to get way more money for the home when you sell it to these investors. So something's going on. I think they're just trying to hide it from the shareholders to see just how much of a bath they're taking. But it's still going to show up on their P&L when they have their next uh, quarterly quarterly uh, uh, stockholders meeting. So it's weird. It, it says... Um, uh, Michael says here, I don't know the motivation of Zillow doing this. Why would they want secrecy? It could possibly be to prevent the embarrassment of showing the large losses that they have. And it's saying uh, um, it's, you know, 
<laughs> it it certainly takes ingenuity to make a gross loss on reselling homes in this market environment. So it's strange. So you got a neighborhood here and Zillow dumps a bunch of them and they don't have the prices there, then the comp comps are going to show what they paid for the home. Now, that's probably better for you as a seller. So the comp's going to be higher so you can get more for your house. Could be better for the buyer if you've you know, if you're trying trying to buy a house in that neighborhood and you're you're going over their asking price, those Zillow inflated comps will help your appraisal come in. Uh, but for the general market, it's not a good idea. I mean, you got to have the right data, and Zillow once again is doing some funky stuff. So, um, speaking of funky stuff, interest rates went up. Duh, uh, they went up uh, Friday because the jobs report came in so strong. Now. Why is that? Well, when the jobs reports come in strong, it indicates a really strong economy. People back out of bonds, go into treasuries, and interest rates go up. When bonds go down, rates go up, mortgage rates go up. The jobs data is very interesting, and we need to watch this the next two months because there's some shenanigans going on there as well. And this is a very complicated article. I'm not about to read the whole thing because it'll make your eyes glaze over. But they had this thing that they called the seasonal adjustment that the uh, uh, that the bureau put out. In other words, they made a seasonal adjustment and a COVID adjustment, and uh, they ended up inflating the job numbers. You can see right here seasonal adjustments from January. See how that line is has gone way up. That's an adjustment. Every outfit that looks at um, and here's another adjustment. Look at that twenty eight thirty three. Every uh, outfit that looks at forecasting what our job growth is going to be was forecasting something like a loss of a hundred thousand. These are January numbers um, up to a gain of a hundred thousand, and they all missed it by fivefold. Now you can't have that many entities miss their mark by that much without something weird going on, and they have adjusted these numbers. And January looks phenomenal, so interest rates went up. So what could happen? Well, because of the adjustments that they've layered in there, February and March are going to look really bad. We're going to see the way that they count this now, job losses. So February is probably going to see a loss of 100,000 jobs. What could that mean for mortgages? Could go down. Who knows? But here's what the people say when they're predicting on MarketWatch here. Um, there's one here that says, and it's always, I always like to look at the, what the realtor.com guy said. One person is just, for perspective, the 30-year mortgage averaged 4% in the 10s and 12.7 in the 80s. People bought plenty of homes in both eras, said Lewis. This month's bank rate chief financial analyst says he expects 30-year mortgage rates between 6.5 and 3.85. We're 3.85 today. Same thing down here. You got the president of, uh, let's see, where is it? I found it down here somewhere. Oh, um, Lawrence Young, chief economist for the National Association of Realtors. The average 30-year mortgage rate is likely to reach 3.8 by the fourth quarter. Well, we're already there. So there is a chance in my interview with Pat on Friday, he said, it's just going to get very muddy. Rates going to go up, go down, go up, go down. But one of the things that we saw this week in... Uh, uh, the seven-day moving average is, yes, we got more listings, but the sales followed them. There's a lot of people out there with 60 and 90-day locks on their interest rate that are about to expire, so now they're in a hurry. They're in a hurry to get out there and try to get another home or get a contract before their rate goes up. Some of these people are probably holding on to a 3.1 rate, and they don't want to go 3.85. So that's going to be another thing to see. So I think we're going to see a lot of activity this week and next week. Good to see the inventory finally starting to come up. But remember, it's still painstakingly low. We're going to be below 5,000 tomorrow. Uh, we've only hit that just a few times over the past couple of years. The other thing we're looking at is affordability. And this is an interesting chart here. And this is from uh, Black Knight. Um, they, they research all of the financial data. And this shows national payment income, payment to income ratio right now showing us at 25.8%. And this is kind of the baseline here, the normal right there, showing an interest rate down here at 3.56 and a ratio up here of 25.8. Now, 
This one, I've always questioned this one here. You see here, this is back in what I call the silly season, 2006 and 2007, where people were buying homes with adjustable rate mortgages. Some were just paying interest only. The prevailing interest rate at the time was 7%. So what they're looking at on this chart is they're comparing your payment as if you were, you were paying full interest at 7%. So this is how far off the payments were, 34.1% of your income, but nobody was making that payment. Everybody had adjustable rate mortgages, but they were sitting there at like 1% or 0% interest making their payments. When they reset, guess where they reset? They reset up to 7%. Now that person that was making a payment that was probably, I don't know, 16% of their, of their income, all of a sudden it doubled and went up to 34. That's why we had a crash. It happened nationally. These charts that show 34.1% are basing it off the prevailing interest rate at the time, but not what people were actually paying. So I thought that was, uh, that was something to look at. It's, it's showing us right now at 25.8%. That's uh, higher than, oh, it's higher than normal, but it's not an alarming one yet where you can say that <coughs> we're probably going to see a crash or anything. So it'll, if it keeps creeping up, as it creeps up gradually and people have fixed interest rate payments, a lot of people will be able to hold on to that, not worried about foreclosures. That number is still not moving at all, even in Black Knight's research. If it starts going up too far, 26%, 27, 28%, then inventory will start building, start showing. Sales will start backing off. It's not going to be a crash from what I can see because there isn't going to be this instant reset of your mortgage payment. Make sense? So in other words, you don't have a mortgage payment right now that's 600 bucks a month, and then next month it's going to be 1,700 bucks a month. So that's what killed us in 2008, actually from 2006 to 2008. And that chart, I think, tells the whole story right there. So we're going to dive in a little bit more on the um, jobs numbers. I want to really wrap my head around that and see what's going on. But until we do that, make sure you hit the like button before you leave. Have a fabulous Monday. Take care. Mm -hmm.